Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series of lessons is on the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. This is lesson number eight in that series for November 23 of 2019, entitled God and the Covenant. Covenant is a word we don't use so much these days. What's that all about? Well, we'll see if we can figure it out. As, you, as always, however, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we, we bow before you right now, recognizing your presence and the presence of your Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us. We think of these experiences that impacted your people of so many years ago. We need to learn from them. We, learned, we need to learn more of you from them. May that be our experience now is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, as we have been working our way through the book of Nehemiah, now we come to chapter 10. So, if you want to follow along, most of what we'll be studying is found in either Nehemiah 9 or 10. It was a time when the Israelites, under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah, pledged themselves in a covenant relationship to God. So, what's a covenant? It's an agreement between two parties. In this case, God, who said... You are my people and I am your God and the people who promise to obey and follow God's will for their lives. So this covenant, this agreement was made following a pattern that was common in those days among the nations around them. As we will see, there was a very typical pattern to this covenant, this agreement between God and his people. There were blessings and curses attached, covenant blessings for those who obeyed and curses for those who disobeyed. So this is... I mean, it's like drawing up a legal contract. There, even in our day, there are certain what we call legalese that you've got to use. Well, they had certain uh, patterns that they expected that someone would use when drawing up a covenant in, in their day. And Nehemiah 10, I'm not going to read it all because almost the entire section is full of names. Mm-hmm. Let's look at the beginning and you'll see what I'm talking about. The first to sign, we're talking about this a covenant, the first to sign was the governor, Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, and then Zedekiah signed, the following also signed, and, bzz, and I'm going to skip all those names all the way down to verse 28. I'm sure you'd love to hear me read and misread all those names, but we're not going to do it right now. Look at verse 28. We, the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the temple guards, the temple musicians, the temple workmen, and all others who in obedience to God's law have separated themselves from the foreigners living in our land. We, together with our wives and our children, old enough to understand. What kind of distinction is he making there? He's talking about people who are old enough to understand. In other words, God doesn't make you know, covenants with people who don't know what's going on. Yeah. Okay? Uh, this idea that somehow we make leaps of faith without knowing what we're doing is crazy. Do here, what All of us do hereby join with our leaders in an oath under penalty of a curse if we break it that we will live according to God's law, which God gave through his servant Moses that we will obey all that the Lord our God commands us and that we will keep all his laws and requirements. Wow. We will not intermarry with foreigners living in our land If foreigners bring corn or anything else to sell to us on the Sabbath or on any other holy day, we will not buy from them, and so forth. We'll get on to more of that later. Notice that it says in there, all these, everybody is involved. Everybody that was old enough to understand. Wow. To understand understand a little better why this covenant was made, see Nehemiah 9, 36 to 38. Carrie, I think you have that for us. Um, Margaret actually has it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. His was the one before that that, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Right. that you read. Okay, this is Nehemiah 9, 36 to 38. And now we are slaves in the land that you gave us, this fertile land which gives us food. What the land produces goes to the kings that you put over us because we sinned. They do as they please with us and us and our livestock, and we are in deep distress. 
Because of all that has happened, we, the people of Israel, hereby make a solemn agreement, and our leaders, our Levites, and our priests put their seals to it. So wow. The Good News Bible. Yeah. It, it is, is it surprising to you that all the people seem to agree to this covenant relationship with God? That, I mean, think of all they had been through. Considering how many times groups have rebelled against God, was this an unusual event? Well, they had had a hard time rebuilding Jerusalem, and yes. they knew it was by the grace of God and God's help exactly. that they were able to do that. Exactly. So it was an important aspect of God's relationship to his people that such a covenant was recorded. In light of all the rebellion, it is good to see that they understood the conditions and the consequences if they disobeyed God. What would it be like if we had the opportunity to do that corporately? Well, while God is excited and happy to see us make pledges to him, he expects those pledges to be followed up by action. Covenant agreements between God and human beings started right back with Genesis 1 and 2. And what was the first covenant? Genesis uh, 3.15. Yeah, and... And I shall put in... Even, even before that, there was another covenant. What was the first covenant? You can eat everything in the garden except... That one tree. One tree. Stay away from this tree. Don't eat of the fruit. Pretty simple, right? I mean, you, it wasn't... I don't think they had a problem understanding the concept. <laughs> but unfortunately, we know what happened. And so, we have, as you mentioned, Genesis 3.15. Well, because of Adam and Eve's sin, a chain of de-creation leading to death soon dominated our world. The stories of the two first surviving sons of Adam and Eve, Cain, Genesis 4, 8 through 19, and Seth, after the death of Abel, Genesis 5, 3 to 24, give us a clear example of the results involved in each side. Cain's genealogy culminated in Lamech in Genesis 4, 17 and 19, the seventh inclusively from Adam, who introduced polygamy. Violence and vengeance characterized the descent of Cain, descendants of Cain. But alongside those evil men stood the faithful lineage of Seth. Seth's genealogy is traced up to number seven also, and beyond, of course, but to seven. In his case, it was Enoch who walked with God, Genesis 5.24. He was taken to heaven without tasting death. So in one line, we have violence, death, polygamy. In the other line, we have someone ascending to heaven without tasting death because he walked with God. What a contrast. I mean, these are guys. These are guys who, in effect, were cousins. Yeah. And think about it. Well, and the thing that I've always wondered about is how could they live like that when they had the Garden of Eden there, the angels there? I mean, it just yeah boggles your mind. Exactly. And Adam, Ellen White says Adam kept taking his family back to the gates of the garden to pray and worship, worship. right there. But Cain didn't, so no. they left. They went yeah. off somewhere else. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we know what the results were. Finally, the world becomes so evil that God realized that if something very significant was not done, all connection between heaven, connection between heaven and earth would be broken. So at that point, when there was still one family, but only one family left who were faithful to God, and not even all of them were faithful to God, God sent a flood and destroyed all the others. Genesis six eleven to thirteen. Even today, what you brought up, yeah, the, what we know and what we see happening in this world. Oh yeah. How can we give up such great salvation? Mm -hmm. How can we? Really. <laughs> mm -hmm. Certainly, all of us at this table, I hope, would agree that the consequences of sin have been terrible, terrible, terrible. We're still living with them on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Well, by a careful reading of the Old Testament and the New Testament, we discover that there have been seven major covenants. And there's it discusses that in our Bible study guide for Monday, November 18, that God has made with his people. See if you can think of those covenants as Jim reads us. We just mentioned the first one with Adam that didn't last very long as far yeah. as not eating. 
the second covenant with Noah, the third covenant with Abraham, we have a fourth covenant with Moses and the Israelite nation. We call that the Mosaic covenant. Then a fifth covenant was with Phineas. And many of us don't recognize that, so read the verse there. Yeah, well, I've never thought of that. The Lord said to Moses, and this is a covenant, because of what Phineas has done, I am no longer angry with the people of Israel. He refused to tolerate the worship of any god but me, and that is why I did not destroy them in my anger. So let him that I am making a covenant tell him, with tell him. So tell him that I am making a covenant with him that is valid for all time to come. He and his descendants are permanently established as priests, because he did not tolerate any rivals to me and brought about forgiveness for the people's sin. So now that was the fifth covenant. What about the sixth covenant? Oh, uh, sixth covenant was with David in Second Samuel seven five to sixteen. I promise to keep you safe from all your enemies and to give you descendants. When you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will make one of your sons king and will keep his kingdom strong. He will be the one to build a temple for me. And I will make sure that his dynasty continues forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him as a father punishes his son. But I will not withdraw my support from him, as I did from Saul, hmm. whom I removed so that you could be king. You will always have descendants, and I will make your kingdom last forever. Your dynasty will never end. Nathan told David everything that God had revealed to him. That's good news, Bible. Have you ever mm -hmm. thought about how Jesus would talk to his ancestors when we get to heaven? <laughs> grandpa, great grandpa. Huh. How about uh, grandmas? Yes. Like, uh, grandmas. Yes. like Ruth. Yes, exactly. Yes. Hey, Ruth, you're Moabite. You're my great-grandma. I always <laughs> tell that. people there's a lot of hobbies in this life, but the hobby of family history, you can really get into it in the yeah. next life. <laughs> wow, exactly. You can sort through your line all the way back. Well, one thing seems to be that the seven com uh, covenants have been, the six at least, uh, one-sided. Is it? Mm -hmm. Do you look at it that way? The Lord makes the covenant. But the seventh one looks like Israel is saying, hey, let's have a deal. Well, the the fifth, co fifth or fourth covenant was a promise that the children of Israel made, and they didn't keep it for very long. But th the best covenant of all is the seventh one, I think. Yeah. Dennis, I think that's yours. That's in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. The Lord says, The time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach their fellow citizen to know the Lord, because all will know me. From the least to the greatest, I will, give their sin, I will forgive their sins, and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, let's stop for a second. What's the difference, what's the major difference you see between the covenant between God and Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai and this covenant? Sanya was uh, was. Let's just let's just look at it for a second before you comment, okay? If we can go to Exodus nineteen and start with verse eight, then all the people answered together, "We will, we will do everything yes. that the Lord has said." And Moses reported this to the Lord, and this is before God had even spoken a word. They, people, no problem. Whatever you say, God, we'll just do it. And a few days later, they are worshiping an idol. Yeah. But now he's saying, I'll put it in their hearts. 
So what's the difference? In the first co- in that covenant from Sinai, the people were the ones who did the promise. Yes. In fact, the, he, if you go to chapter 24, they promised it twice more. The same right. thing, promised. Right. We will do that. Now here, who's promising? The Lord. God is, God is promising. That is the big difference between... Put it in their hearts. But he's putting it in the hearts. I think yeah. that's the biggest thing. The question thing. is, when does that take place? Yeah. I mean, thinking about what the words say, mm-hmm. you say, is that going to be in the new earth? Does that no. come now? Well... Do we have possibilities? It's, it's God's right plan that that becomes a part of our lives every day as we learn more and more about okay. God and we seek day by day to become more like Jesus. That's a... It's, this is not something that happens, bang, all of a sudden on one occasion. This is a growing experience. Verse 34 says, None of them will have to teach his fellow yeah. citizen right. to know the Lord, yes. because yeah. all will know. Yeah. Now, to that, me, I that's said, all that yeah. know. Sanctification. That seems yeah. like it's that's not in the, on this earth. No, that's in the like, good new, the new land. Well, one interesting aspect, and here's another one I want you to think about, of God's covenants with human beings is that they are often described as everlasting covenants. Now, since human beings are very short, live very short lives relative to God's life, what does everlasting covenant mean? I mean, doesn't that seem like God's just sort of being a little bit flippant? Everlasting covenant? Sorry, God, I'm only around for a few years. Well, it's often to the descendants, mm-hmm. you know, like Abraham, uh, in you all the seed of of the earth will be blessed. So uh, anyone who then is a child of Abraham uh, receives the blessing too. So it's an everlasting, ongoing covenant. And this is, this one here is is an everlasting, ongoing I think it goes on. All people. It goes on forever into the yeah. new earth. Yeah, it did. I mean, really. It goes on yeah. forever. Let's just look at a couple of them very quickly. The first one is in Genesis 9.16. When the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it. Remember the everlasting covenant between me and all the all living beings on earth. Now, pretty clear, right? And jump way down almost to the end of the New Testament. Hebrews 12, I'm sorry, Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. God has raised from death our Lord Jesus, who is the great shepherd of the sheep as a result of his blood, by which the eternal covenant is sealed. May the God of peace provide you with every good thing you need in order to do his will. And may he, through Jesus Christ, do in us what pleases him and to Christ be the glory forever and ever. The eternal covenant. So clearly, it has to go down into the, yes. the, the next, our next world. Yes. Well, the, the, the term everlasting covenant is mentioned in the Bible 16 times. 13 of those times apply specifically to the covenants with Abraham, Israel, at Sinai and David. The very first covenant between God and sinful human beings is the one you mentioned, Genesis 3.15. It finds its fulfillment, however, ultimately in the life and death of Jesus. But the everlasting covenants mentioned repeatedly also expand and are repeated in one form or another right through the New Testament. Just as Jeremiah 31.31-34 is repeated and how, what, four or five different times in the New Testament. Hebrews 8, 10, and 11 is just one example. So, let's see, Jim, I think you're next. We are to become like God, as he says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Jeremiah 31, okay, 33. I'm going to end up right there. How does that happen? Jim, you asked this question before. How is it that he puts his law in our minds and writes it on our hearts? educates, teaches us, uh, provides evidence. Uh, we spend time with him and we, we incorporate, we read, we listen, we hear. The more we do that, the more it's in our minds and in our hearts. Well, John six sixty three. Yeah. the words I have spoken are spirit and their life. Yeah. And it, it, it's, he, he, everything God does, Jesus did when he was here, he talked. Yeah. When he created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1, he spoke. Until he got to man, then he formed man out of the dust of the earth, and then it felt uh, came to me when they were out on the on the Sea of Gal- Galilee and the storm came up. He talked to the uh, the elements, yeah. and uh, when when you choose to not listen, which is the words of a spirit of truth, he just honors your choice and 
the, all kinds of bad things can happen. Yeah. He doesn't have to be an active agent. He just he controls everything with his with the words of his mouth. Anyway, let's press on. I have to. Well, yeah, we will in a second. I just want to add one thing. I just I, I just love those stories about Jesus on the Sea of Galilee. There's several of them. Yeah. But here's a fisherman. These fishermen have been, lived on that Sea of Galilee all their lives. They supposedly knew every trick in the in, in the book, and they're out there drowning. And the carpenter stands up and says, "Peace be still." Yeah, but they woke. They had, they had to wake him up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just amazing. It's just amazing. You know. One, one thing also, though, the people who lived in the shores, they worshipped wind and waves. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, wait, 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 wait a minute. Who is this carpenter? You know, <laughs> that the gods that we worship. Those yeah. gods, those be. gods that they had was was Baal worship, yeah. like Mount yeah. Hermon and the yeah. the stone yeah. and and storms and so forth. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Jim. Amazing. Okay, uh, part uh, number two. We will let, once again live again in harmony with God. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Jeremiah thirty one thirty four. That's in harmony. Number three. We will accept God's mission for us to spread the truth about Him to all nations, Jeremiah thirty-one, thirty-four. Are we willing to do that? Mm. Mm. Go ahead. Number four, God is forgiveness personified. He reminds us that no matter how many times we have fallen away from Him and transgressed His laws, He will forgive us and treat us as if it had never happened. Jeremiah 31, 34 again in Hebrews 8, 12. Can I interrupt again for just a second? What is the unpardonable sin? Refusing to listen. In light of what we just read there? Refusing to be taught. Yeah. The only people who commit the unpardonable sin are the ones who say, absolutely, finally, I am not coming back. No matter what you do, God, I won't come back. And it's a judgment call on our part. It's our part. Not God making a judgment. We judge God. We choose. I don't want to listen to you. I don't want to be bothered with what you have to say. Interesting you mention this because we had a discussion today while playing golf in our foursome about what the unforgivable sin was. And Richard says, you know, there isn't such a thing unless you choose it. Yeah. Right. Because God forgives. If you turn to him and ask forgiveness, he forgives everything. Yeah. Well, even those that don't ask for forgiveness or forgive them, your problem is all through the Old Testament, God says, I'll heal you, I'll restore you. Mm-hmm. Salvation, health, healing. healing is healing. Yeah. And you can't be healed without spending some time listening. So, how does all this happen? Charles, I think you have something on that. It is law both of the intellectual and spiritual nature that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually accepts, adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which is accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than the standard of purity or godliness or, or truth. If self is his loftiest ideal, he will never attain anything more exalted. Rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has the power to exalt man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. Wow. Wow. That's a magnificent statement. Wow. Yes, Yes. Yes. really. The grace of God right, alone. Right. I mean, that's right, right. Just but what is His grace? Is is teaching? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> he, he, <laughs> and it blows your mind when the entire Christendom it says, "No law, no law. We all we need is yeah. grace." To me, wow. grace is loving forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Total yes. loving forgiveness. Yep. He's so interested in us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He beautiful, wants beautiful our attention. Statement. He craves our attention. But. Well, and the the yeah. pro- forgiveness is not the big thing. It, it, yeah. it keeps us from maybe not being afraid of him, but it's the willingness to listen and take instruction from the greatest teacher who ever lived. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so many of our Christian friends think that forgiveness is the big thing because they think God is the the boogeyman. The Father is the God, bad guy up there just waiting with a big stick ready to zap us, and Jesus has to plead. And so if we can get the Father to forgive us, whew, we made it. 
But there's a problem, though. This if doesn't work. If there is no law, out. why do you need forgiveness? Yeah, that's another problem. <laughs> so God what is a normal... God could have just forgiven Adam and Eve in the beginning and just started over if that was all it yeah. took. Yeah, but they're already sin in the universe. He had to educate the, uh, even the ones that didn't sin. Angels. They had to be. Le- it wasn't until the cross we get in Colossians one nineteen and the twenty and Ephesians yeah. one nine and ten. It's other places. It wasn't until then that they were secured yeah. in their understanding. So, what is a normal pattern we would expect to see in a covenant? The ancient Hittites, and that, remember that's where the area where, where Abraham came from, yeah. spelled out covenants in detail. They lived very close to the place where Adam. Ca- well, I'm sorry, where Abram came from probably the closest place where Adam came from as well. The covenants that were common during the time of ancient Israel had the following parts. A preamble, who God is, in our case, what we're interested in. Historical prologue, past relationship defined, in other words, review what happened in the past, sort of what led up to this particular experience. The stipulations or laws, blessings and curses, witnesses, special provision or sign of the covenant. Thus, it should be no surprise that God used something similar in communicating to his people back then. He used what they were familiar with. So, what do we say? God speaks to a language, speaks in a language that we understand. Uh One of the best examples of such a covenant is the whole book of Deuteronomy. And, Carrie, I think you have a few words about that. Yes. It expresses the covenant in the following manner. Uh, one preamble, Deuteronomy 1, verses 1 to 5. Two, historical prologues, Deuteronomy 1, 6 to 4 and 43. Number three, stipulations or laws, Deuteronomy 4, 44 to 26, 19. Four, blessings and curses, Deuteronomy 27 to 30. Five, witnesses, Deuteronomy 30, Verse 19. And finally, 6. Special provision, Deuteronomy 31, verses 9 to 13. That's from the Bible study guide. Wow. So the children of Israel were expected to read the book of Deuteronomy at the Feast of Tabernacles at least once every seven years at the year of Jubilee, which was the time of the resettlement of debts. Imagine coming. Thousands of people gathering in the in the in the courtyard of the temple, and having someone, and I don't know if they did this ever, but they were supposed to sit there and do like Ezra did with the his readers there, and and, and spelling that out, reading it to everybody that had come to the, to the celebration. Wow. Do you think they were still doing that in the days of Jesus? What do you think Jesus would have thought about it if they were doing it? Would he have jumped up and said, those are my words? <laughs> Which is what he should have said, right? <laughs> yeah. Another covenant that was recorded in the scriptures found in Joshua 24. Margaret? All right. First, a preamble is mentioned in which God presents himself as <clears throat> the Lord, the God of Israel. That was Joshua 24, verse 2. Then follows a long historical prologue through which Joshua reminds the people of what God has done for them in the past. That's Joshua 24, 2 to 13. After this history, the stipulations or laws are enumerated. Joshua 24, 14, 25, and 23. Blessings and curses are mentioned, and that's in Joshua 24, 19, and 20. Mm -hmm. Witnesses identified Joshua 24, 22, and 27, and special provisions stated, Joshua 24, verses 25 and 26. Here, too, the basic form of a covenant was used to communicate with the Israelites and to show them not only God's leading in their past, but what was required of them to uphold their end of the covenant. This is from the Bible Study Guide. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you, why do we need to know that God established on more than one occasion a covenant following this ancient legal pattern? Does that really matter? Yeah. Well, the first one with Adam and Eve, there was no 
no. uh, pattern to follow. I guess. But here we're talking about a pattern that was looks like it came from the Hittites. Why would God follow that? Is that the Code of Hammurabi? Well, the Code of, Code of Hammurabi was many, many years before that. Hmm. He was over in Mesopotamia. The Hittites lived Hittite. in what, what today would be, would be Turkey. Turkey. Hmm. So why would God follow their pattern? Well, as you said earlier, he uses the language of the people, things that they were familiar with. Um, but sometimes it's hard to know, you know, what the chicken is or the egg. You know, did, is, is that a corruption of something that God yeah. instituted before? Or is he just using a form that these people created? Very good. Very that he can use. People. I think you're right on the letters. letters. Yeah, they're close to the Israelites, just north of it. Yeah, see. exactly. And many his many Hittites ended up living down in Palestine with the Jewish people. I mean, guess what? Guess who was the first Uriah. husband of Bathsheba? Uriah the Hittite. Uriah the Hittite. Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. The, those, the other cultures infected Israel with their thinking. Okay, so here's a here's a not so trivial question, a very important question. Along that same line, can you think of another important example where someone in the Bible followed one of these patterns from another nation that had enormous implications for the rest of the world from that day until this? I'm trying to make it a little bit complicated. Old Testament. Yeah, Old Testament. Something that happened in the Old Testament that impacts every one of us. Uh, Moses managed. Well, no. Abraham, Abraham took an, an extra Hagar. wife. Exactly. That was a oh. custom that came straight yeah. from the Hittites. If your wife doesn't give you a child, you marry a secondary wife, and that child is regarded as your. the child of first your first wife. wife. That was straight out of Hittite mm. custom. Then offering your children to the fire. That, that, well, was, that, <laughs> yeah, that, was, a, that was never part of God's plan. These are cases where God allowed his chosen people to follow a custom that came, at least as far as we know, came from another national group. Well, some may feel a little uncomfortable with the goal of our becoming more and more like God. We cannot change ourselves. We've just read that up earlier. We only have the option of choosing to allow God to change us or we allow Satan to change us. So what is the focus of our lives? What do we spend our time doing, listening to, mm. seeing? What did Israel promise to do? <laughs> well, Jim? Nehemiah 10, verse 30 to 39 is a lengthy list of things they promise. Starting with, we will not intermarry with foreigners living in our land. Verse 31, if foreigners bring corn or anything else to sell to us on Sabbath or on any other holy day, we will not buy from them. Can I interrupt for just a second? Remember those two provisions because we're going to be talking about them in future lessons. Every seventh year we will not farm the land and we will cancel all debts. Every year we will each contribute five grams of silver to help pay the expenses of the temple. We will provide for the temple worship the following, the sacred bread, the daily grain offerings, the animals to be burnt each day as sacrifices, the sacred offerings for Sabbaths, new moon festivals, and other festivals, the other sacred offerings, the offerings to take away the sins of Israel, and anything else needed for the temple. Listing of all those sacrifices, there's a lot of different animals involved, Yep. And a lot of sacrifices exactly. for different things. We, the people, priests and Levites, will draw lots each year to determine which clans are to provide wood to burn the sacrifices offered to the Lord our God according to the requirements of the law. And if you go, if you go back, mm -hmm. following your pattern here, if you go back to the days of David, he divided the whole country up, especially the Levites and so forth, saying, okay, these two weeks you're going to do this and this and this and this and then the next two weeks you're going to do this and this and this and this next two weeks you're going to do this and this and this and this everybody wants supposed to be a part now you sure see some organization there yep 
And going on, starting with verse 35 in that chapter, we will take to the temple each year an offering of the first corn we harvest and of the first fruit that ripens on our trees. The first son born to each of us we will take to the priests in the Mm -hmm. temple and there, as required by the law, dedicate him to God. We will also dedicate the first calf born to each of our cows and the first lamb or kid born to each of our sheep or goats. We will take to the priests in the temple the dough made from the first corn harvested each year and our other offerings of wine, olive oil, and all kinds of fruit. We will take to the Levites who collect tithes in our farming villages the tithes from the crops that grow on our land. Let me stop for, stop you there for just a minute. Who are these Levites living in the farming villages? I thought the Levites were supposed to be connected to the temple. Yeah. Well, they rotated. Yeah. Like okay, uh, but John the, the Baptist's father, they li- he lived in the hill country, but he took his turn. Uh, okay, what were they doing out there in those villages? Looks like they were collecting the tithes. Exactly. Tax so they were the legal system. They were the government. They were everything. So you, if you remember, when the children of Israel were settled in the land of Palestine, there were 48 cities that were given to the Levites. And even well, though... It would be spread through every tribe. Through every That's tribe, the there, there were a bunch of Levites scattered. And so they were supposed to do what? They were supposed to collect the offerings that went to the temple. They were supposed to provide the legal system. They were supposed to be the judges. They were supposed to do all... And the teaching... So that's why they were scattered out. They were supposed to be doing all these things for the people all the time. And so uh, that's why we we can see what's going on here, how they were involved. Okay, Jim? We're still in that list of things they promised to do. Priests who are descended from Aaron are to be with the Levites when tithes are collected and for use in the temples. The Levites are to take to the temple storerooms one-tenth of all the tithes they collect. What did they do with the other tenth? Well, Nine-tenths of the tithes. Okay, so that's, that's an important principle that the Seventh-day Adventist Church still follows. So they, the Levites would collect the full tithe because remember they were, the ten, they were the, one of the twelve tribes and that, that tithe was to support them. Then they took a tenth of the tithe, the tithe that they got and gave it to the priests who were direct descendants of Aaron. So they got a tithe of a tithe. And if you look at the way the Adventist Church works today, we give our tithes to the local conference. They give a tenth of that to the Union Conference. The Union Conference gives a tenth of that to the General Conference. Mm. That's the way we do things. I didn't realize mm. it. The people of Israel and the Levites are to take the contri- contributions of corn, wine, and olive oil to the storerooms where the utensils for the temple are kept and where the priests who are on duty, <clears throat> the temple guards and the members of the temple choir have their quarters. We will not neglect the house of God. Good wow. news Bible. There's a lot there about the temple. Wow. And the organization down to the minutest detail when you think about it. The keeping Corn of the Sabbath and, and all and that fruit. stuff. Yeah. But this is nothing new though. This was given before so they're just reiterating that yep. yes, we will yep. do them. I have a question though. We're very fairly close, 400 years, and Jesus is here on earth, and there were so many, so many laws, 500 or some laws to keep the Sabbath. Yep. You see, so uh, this is not the time though. Did it come later on that they put okay. all of this together? When Ezra, when Ezra was the person we're talking about now. Right. He was the first of what we call the scribes. He did several very important things. The first and most important thing probably was he pulled together all the pieces that he could get of the Bible and said, okay, let's copy, let's make copies. But this is all good, though. This yeah, this is, so absolutely. Then so in the process of, the process of pulling it all together, he recognized, hey, this stuff is all written in Hebrew, and none of us... That's not our language anymore. So the next job, he said, is, okay, I will have to take all this stuff written in Hebrew, and I will have to explain it to people. I have to teach them from these things that most of them can't read. Mm -hmm. Well, then, guess what? He he spawned a whole group of people who became the scribes. They were the ones who read the, the, they could read the Hebrew, and then their job was to explain it to the local people. 
So by the time, and so what, what happened is stuff that's even happening today, they would read a portion of scripture and they would say, oh, and they would expound upon it. And then someone else would hear what they said and they would expound on it further. And lo and behold, 400 years later, we've got all these rules about this is someone expounding on someone else's expounding on someone else's expounding about how we're supposed to keep all these rules. So that's how they the, wanted how to do that so they didn't go back into captivity. Yeah. When you <laughs> think about why they were doing it, what interests me is how the politics came about. Oh, yes. Where did the beginning of the Pharisees, the beginning of the Sadducees, well, and that select group that were around called the Essenes? Right. Yeah. yeah, there were three three major groups. The, the, the Pharisees... And what what that came out of was the the Greek were things under Alexander. Alexander, when he conquered the world, basically he said, "You know, all you people are great and nice and all that kind of stuff, but you all need to become Greeks. You need to speak the Greek language. You need to practice Greek customs. You need to design your cities according to Greek things. All this kind of stuff." And basically, down to Judaism, down to Hebrew, late Hebrew history. What happened is the Pharisees said, no, we are going to resist all these trends. Whereas the Sadducees said, why do we need to resist them? Let's just go along. Why, why cooperate. fight? With, why, cooperate, yeah. So to... that was the argument. The Pharisees said, no, we, will, we need to go back to God. If we would just go back to God's way for our lives, then things would be fine. And the Sadducees said, calm down, just relax. We, we, let's get along. Let's. So th that's how that all got started. And the Essenes were originally a part of probably the Pharisees, but as they saw things deteriorating in the temple and all the nonsense that was going on there, they said, they just said, we're going to get out of here. And they just went, moved down almost to the Dead Sea and they said, those people out there up there are so corrupt, we, we can't be a part of them. We'll ha we'll. Mm. And they, they came up with their own bunch of rules, crazy rules. They moved far right in their politics. <laughs> they... Very they had concerned. rules that said you couldn't even go to the bathroom on the Sabbath. <laughs> oh my so word. you think about... <laughs> Oops. <laughs> oh, wow. But there yeah. were some things that weren't too bad because well, they sure. said women shouldn't carry the water. Men should do it. Wow. wow. Great. Did yeah. you know okay. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, mm. we diverted a little bit here, but that's okay. Yes. It should be clear that these are fairly basic requirements. They were, re they were repeated again and again, and now these people are saying, yes, God, we will do what you asked us to do. Mm -hmm. But if they were practiced regularly, they would have led to a good relationship with God. None, especially the, com uh, the committee to a proper, the commitment, I'm sorry, to a proper keeping of the seventh-day Sabbath, notice especially. But as, unfortunately, as we know, they repeatedly broke that covenant. Our only hope of not breaking God's covenant with us is to keep our eyes focused on His plans and His promises and to allow the Holy Spirit to work on our lives to change us to become more like Him every day. That's a wonderful sentence. Yeah. Our only hope of not breaking God's covenant mm -hmm. with us is to keep our eyes focused on His plans and His promises. That's beautiful. Mm. Okay. Jackie, I think you're next. And this is a wonderful quote by Ellen White in Steps to Christ. Through the right exercise of the will, an entire change may be made in your life. By yielding up your will to Christ, you ally yourself with a power that is above all principalities and powers. You will have strength from above to hold you steadfast, and thus through constant surrender to God, you will be enabled to live the new life, even the life of faith. Wow. Amen. So what did, what did she mean by the proper exercise of the will? The right exercise of the will? Yielding up our will to Christ. Okay. How do we do that? Listen. Okay. Take Focus. instruction. Focus. Yeah. So many people down through the generations have said, our job is to do everything right. We just got to do it. That's not what God asks us to do. He says, listen to me. Let me teach you. I will do the changing. You don't, you don't have to make yourself perfect. You can't. You can't. First of all, yeah. you can't. And John's 30 minutes from now when you forget, come <laughs> back to me. <laughs> John, in John 17, 3, Jesus says, eternal life is to know the Father 
and Jesus Christ to whom he has sent. And what did Jesus do? He came as a teacher. Yeah, yeah, and a healer. God. Well, the healing is yeah. by education. It's, yeah. it's the healing of the mind. It isn't your yeah, cancer yeah. Yeah. or whatever. God also required the children of Israel to make a commitment to caring for his temple here on this earth. At first, it was only the tabernacle in the wilderness. But the children of Israel promised to give so much for the construction of that tent that Moses had to tell them to stop bringing their gifts. Mm-hmm. Amazing. How many of you have been in church building programs when they said, wait, hold it, uh-huh. you're giving too much? That'd be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <clears throat> well, God set out a very clear pattern as to how the offerings from the people were to be distributed. A tenth of all the increases and of all the offerings were to be given to the Levites. We talked about this a little earlier. And a tenth of those offerings to the Levites was to be given to the descendants of Aaron, the priest. As we know, the children of Israel were expected to go to the temple for major services at least three times a year. Now later, when they, when they, many of them lived all the way in Palestine, in, in, in Galilee and other places like that, they were expected to try to make it at least one service each year. How much time commitment was it to make a, if you lived in Galilee, to make it to one of these services? You know? A week. It took a week to get there, a week to experience the service, and a week to go home. Because wow. you walked. Yeah. yeah. So just to go to one of those services was a three week commitment. And if there's three festivals, that's yeah. nine weeks of camp meeting, isn't it? Yep. And a journey. Yep, exactly. Together. The logistics involved. In but if it's too far, you call it around the 14 kicks in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you sell well, what you got and buy whatever what you want. <laughs> yeah, uh, but you still were supposed to do it at the temple. But it was fun, I bet. They looked forward to Oh, yeah. These oh. were the... These were the these social occasions. Sure, so the big social occasions, occasion. big gatherings. Well, yes. and, and we the Spend example time of that together walking and talking. Yeah, yeah. The, the example of that is, is the, the time when his parents forgot Jesus. Yeah. It was a great social occasion. They just expect that everybody was together, including Jesus, and they were all having a wonderful time talking, etc., and walking along. And where's Jesus? <laughs> but the sad part about it, all of those festivals didn't do anything. Because Jesus finally had to come to give them the straight message because they, they still didn't understand. Yeah. It's a good custom, I think. I remember growing up, you know, camp meetings and... Uh, oh, I'm not morning. talking about camp meetings. I'm talking about the festivals that the, yeah. the, 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 the Israelites or Jude, Jews said. That. That was their custom. Oh, I, uh, well, there are still many lessons that we could learn about God from the ancient sanctuary and its ceremonies. Uh, let's look at this passage from Romans 5 starting with verse 5. This hope does not disappoint us, for God has poured out his love into our hearts by means of the Holy Spirit, who is God's gift to us. For when we were still helpless, Christ died for the wicked at the time that God chose. It is a difficult thing for someone to die for a righteous person. It may even be that someone might dare to die for a good person. But God has shown us how much he loves us. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. By his blood we are now put right with God. How much more then will we be saved by him from God's anger? We were God's enemies, but he made us his friends through the death of his son. Now that we are God's friends, how much more will we be saved by Christ's life? But that is not all. We rejoice because of what God has done through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has now made us God's friends. Wow, what a passage. God wants us to be his friends. So how does the death of Jesus put us right with God? What are we supposed to learn from his death? The life and death of Jesus gives us a clear choice. We can choose to live a life following his example and live forever, or we can choose to rebel against him and die the second death that he died by being separated from God, the only source of life. Hmm. This was symbolized by the different ceremonies. Look back over your own life. How often have you been unfaithful to your God? How How often has God accepted you back again? God's covenant of forgiveness and pardon was sealed by the death of Jesus Christ. And, of course, we know about that. Luke 22, 20, Hebrews 8, 13, and 19. 
Uh, well, I think I have time to read the passage there from Hebrews. Look at Hebrews 8.13. By speaking of a new covenant, God has made the first one old, and anything that becomes old and worn out will soon disappear. And Jim, there's your comment. Those old ceremonies didn't accomplish what they were supposed to accomplish. Not that it was wrong. They just, the people didn't respond in the way. And look at 9.15. For this reason, Christ is the one who arranges a new covenant so that those who have been called by God may receive the eternal blessings that God has promised. This can be done because there has been a death which sets people free from the wrongs they did while the first covenant was in force. So, what led the children of Israel to go through this important covenant, establish, covenant establishing process? Well, Nehemiah 8 and 9 talk about the reading of Scripture, the confessions, the praises, and the petitions that led up to this experience in Nehemiah 10. Why do we as human beings have such a hard time maintaining our trust in God? Has God ever been unfaithful? In fact, God always takes the first step in trying to reestablish a relationship with us. One of the most interesting covenant ceremonies found in the Bible is the story of Abraham as recorded in Genesis 15. Okay? Abraham follows the established custom of establishing a covenant between two parties. The literal translation for making a covenant is cutting a covenant because it is involved in the cutting of animals. Depending wow. on how wealthy the vassal, the servant was, he or she could bring a variety of animals to split in half. The vassal did the work of splitting the animals in half and then pledging an oath to the overlord. Can I interrupt for a second? How do you split an animal in half? Lots well, of blood. Well, it depends well, on top which to bottom or crossways. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll think a, about it. That would be good, easier crossways. Yeah, really. you, I mean, you'd almost have to cut this way because you couldn't cut through the middle of the spine. I mean, even when, if you went to one side, a whole bunch of ribs. Seems like when, there's when, a lot of blood. When Abraham cut the, when he made the covenant yeah. with the angels and he cut the animals to and laid them to sides, did he cut that? Lengthwise, or did he so cut them? Wondering. That's what I'm. That's how my did question. they do that? Yeah. How did they do that? They didn't have electric saws nowadays. They had pretty good yeah. cut through, you know, sharp knives. <laughs> they did, but uh, it, even to slice through the vertebra, you know, it's yeah, it's, uh, it would be too much. I I think they just cut it's through the only. middle. Cut through the middle. I, I think it's not talk about it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it depends well, on the size of the animal. <laughs> what? It depends on the size of the animal. I mean, well, we're talking about cows here. Like a heifer. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Wow. Big chunks of meat. And there's a lot of blood. Oh. <laughs> Soaking um, through the sand. Uh, we're making. It seems uh, like a very pagan <laughs> thing to me. Yeah. Okay, Dennis. I'm sorry. We've that. had enough of the deviation right. here. Since Abraham is affluent, he brings a heifer, a female goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He cut each of the animals down the middle and placed them uh, opposite each other on the ground, creating a path in between them. The birds were left whole because of their small size and placed opposite each other. The job of the vassal was now to walk between the cut pieces and proclaim something to the effect of, let it be done to me as was done to these animals if I break this covenant. Wow. Mm. The overlord did not do the walking between the pieces because it was done only by the one who had the lower status in the relationship. So as was customary, Abraham would have walked between the pieces as a vassal even though he is doing, his doing so is not spec specifically mentioned in the text. Is what is mentioned is what comes next. Right. What happened? God did it. So Abraham sat there and what did he do? He kept the flies off the meat. He kept any animals from coming and eating. He's there guarding these pieces of meat. Imagine him, you know, after having gone through that gory process. He's there watching. And then as darkness falls, what happens? God. You remember? God. I think he fell asleep, didn't he? Or something happened. Well, but then, okay. Uh, maybe we should go back and, and God comes. Yeah, I'm just exactly look, looking at it. that coming out of our Sabbath school study guide. Who wrote that? Who came through with that detailed? 
the I, description. I'm baffled by that. There's no yeah, it would footnote. Be, we could look up. It'll, it'll be on, it'll be whoever wrote the teacher's portion of the guide. Where did he get his information? Now you're asking lots of questions here. Well, uh, that this is the book yeah. that accompanies the lesson, which yeah. comes out much earlier. So, yeah. I, and I don't recognize the the name here. I'm, yeah. Um, but we should. That's uh, a lot of Jerry M Muscala. Yeah, he he uh, it it. What happens is that Abraham falls asleep. He wakes up and then, or he sees it in vision. I don't know. He sees a smoking pot and a cloud or something like right. that that passes through. I mean, what did he think was happening? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm just reading that. that what do we think was happening? Read it. <laughs> that that evening uh, he had he well he okay he he did what he was told. He cut each one down the middle and laid the halves side by side. He did not, however, divide the birds in half. Yeah. Some vultures came down to eat the carcasses, but Abraham chased them away. Yep. That evening, as the sun was going down, Abraham fell into a deep sleep. Mm -hmm. He was he saw a terrifying vision of darkness and horror. Mm -hmm. Then the Lord told Abraham, You can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land, and they will be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. Mm -hmm. But I will punish the nation that enslaves them, and in the end they will come away with great wealth. But you will die in peace at a ripe old age. After four generations, your descendants will return here to this land, and when the sin, uh, when the sin of the Amorites has run its course. Okay, it, you, what what are the verses? Can you give us what's the passage there that you read? It's Genesis 15 verses, uh, starting verse 10. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Well, could you cut animals in half and lay them out on the ground? What would it smell like? What would you hear? Would there be any anything for you to taste? How would you see? What would you see and feel? So, what, do you think? How do you think Abraham felt after doing all that? Remember, he was used to sacrificing animals, so it wasn't such a big deal for him. So the children of Israel in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah wanted to reestablish their relationship with God, and so they followed the pattern that was recognized in the nations around them at, at that time. What would a covenant look like in our day? Mm -hmm. Would we follow the legal example of people in our day? We certainly would not cut animals in half. What role would the Holy Spirit play in a covenant in our day? What is God asking us to do? What kind of a covenant does God want to have with you? and with me in 2019. Kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of studying these passages from so long ago, people with customs that might have seemed strange to us, do seem strange to us. And yet we recognize that you have knelt down so far to try to reach us where we are and to make known to us uh, what you want of us and telling us especially that you want to be our friend. What an incredible offer, and we accept. We ask for that experience today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.